Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we are going to do the second half of part two of the Battle of Midway. Here we use uh, Counter-Strike. We left off essentially examining how this all played out, some of the mistakes that the, the Japanese made. Um, I think the last mistake that was talked about was the, the last carrier being with the surface group when they were going to try to engage in a surface battle, um, which really didn't make any sense at the time. Also, the closing of distance, even though the Japanese planes had obviously longer distance than the U.S. planes did. So looking at a couple different mistakes, that's where we're going to start off. Let's get into it. So why are they doing this? Why is the Hiryu still closing the distance with the Americans? Well, we don't really know. Maybe Nagumo believed the Americans were also seeking a surface engagement? But by 1240, this was shown to be highly unlikely based on the Americans changing course to the east, away from him. Yeah, they, they did not want anything to do with the surface battle. Why would they? Why would they? They're, this is a coup for the U.S. So what it seems like is that after 10.30, the Japanese became short-sighted and got this type of tunnel vision where they were just focused on one thing, destroying the enemy. For both Nagumo and Yamaguchi, this fight had become personal. They were so determined to exact revenge and so caught up in the heat of the moment that they forgot to employ their assets carefully. Yep, and that's what it looks like. It looks like revenge, right? It looks like... Well, tunnel vision is actually a really good way to put that because that's that's what it seems like happens. They they are so bothered by the the U.S. attacks and probably that the U.S. caught them off guard. Um, that yeah, they just they got tunnel vision and wanted revenge. At least that's what it seems like. Also, cultural and societal norms may have begun to cloud their thinking. Japanese society places a lot of value on honor and fulfilling one's duty. And we can see this occurring throughout World War II, with many soldiers ending their own lives rather than being taken prisoner, which was seen as a shameful act. There's a popular Japanese phrase that says, please continue trying to do your best. In other words, at this moment, winning was optional, but trying your hardest was not. Even if the situation was hopeless and doomed, they had to show that they were at least trying to win. But by doing so, they lost sight of the bigger picture. Saving this last precious carrier could have so well aided the Japanese in future operations. Both are to blame for this imprudent decision. It seems as if both were more concerned with preserving their personal honor instead of focusing on preserving this invaluable and irreplaceable carrier of their nation. Admittedly, striking back at the enemy had made good sense, but exposing your carrier to American air attack had not. So what they should have done is that they should have let the surface units close the gap, but not the carrier. They could have detached the Hiryu with an escort to the west and opened the range even before Tamanaga's force had taken off at 1330. Her aircraft still had the range to strike to Yorktown and make it back home, but instead the Hiryu spent all afternoon closing the gap with the enemy. Only at 1550, when reports confirmed that the Hiryu was still facing two operational carriers, did she head northwest. But by this point, it was too little, too late. The consequence for the reckless decision had already caught up to them. The Americans had lost contact with the enemy after the 1030 attack. They didn't know where the Hiryu was, so at 11.33, the Yorktown began sending out search planes to regain contact with the enemy. One of these planes had already reached the search limit, but the pilot decided to push just a little further. At 14.30, his perseverance paid off when on his return leg, he came across the Hiryu. It was only 130 miles away from Task Force 16, well within strike range. If the Kirobutai had turned northwest immediately after launching Tamanaga strike at 13.30, the Hiryu would have been 35 miles further west at 1430, and chances are she would have never been spotted. 
so much for saving your last precious carrier. Once the Americans received the sighting report, a strike was immediately sent. The first wave was a mixed bag of Enterprise dive bombers with Yorktown survivors, followed by the Hornet who launched her own strike 30 minutes later. At 1645, the first group sighted the Hiryu. The dive bombers swung around to the southwest so that they could approach with the sun to their backs. The two squadrons decided to concentrate on a ship apiece. The Yorktown bombers, much to their resentment, were selected to go for a battleship, while the 10 Enterprise dive bombers got the main prize of taking out the carrier. 13 fighters were on combat air patrol. These pilots were no doubt fatigued at this point, and the clever tactic of approaching out of the sun must have worked because for the second time this day, the Japanese were caught by surprise. They didn't spot the Americans until they were practically on top of them and this perhaps highlights the Japanese's greatest weakness in carrier warfare, their lack of radar. Yep, we talked about this in the uh, Coral Sea video, I believe, but Intel is massive, massive in these early battles in the Pacific. Really, it's going to be massive all over the place during World War II in all of the theaters. But because this is such a new brand and type of warfare intel just makes all the difference in the world and you don't have to spot vessels in fact this whole battle has taken place and and coral sea took place with just carrier on carrier fighting and so you don't ever actually see enemy vessels right and so you need recon in just the worst way. And radar is, is really, it's really good for being able to give you intel, for being able to give you a heads up on enemy location, for planes or vessels or, or whatever. Um, and even though the radar is, it makes huge strides in here. So I don't want to say like all radar sucks. But even though it's a more primitive version of radar, it is still worth its weight in gold in these engagements. The Enterprise dive bombers began their attack at 1705. The carrier made a hard turn to port. This threw off their aim and resulted in the first few bombs missing their mark. Thankfully for the Americans, the planes from the Yorktown saw this and diverted. Hidu's time had come. Dive bombers that's hilarious because they didn't want to go for the battleship anyway, right? And so they were probably taking their time going over towards the battleship. And as soon as they see that the carriers missed, they're like, oh, perfect. We got new orders. Armors were able to land a devastating total of four hits, all on the forward part of the Hiryu. The powerful explosions ripped the forward deck apart. Although the Hiryu hadn't been as packed with field up and armed aircraft like her three sisters, Four bombs were enough to shatter this lightly armed carrier. Flight operations were out of order for the Hiryu. The remaining Dauntlesses went for the battleship but missed. Fifteen minutes later came Hornet's group. They ignored the Hiryu seeing that she was doomed and went for the cruisers, but to no avail. No hits were scored. In total, the Americans lost only three aircraft in the attack. All four carriers were now out of operation. Incredibly, Yamamoto still believed he could grasp victory from the jaws of defeat. He still entertained the prospect that Midway could be taken and that the American force could be destroyed in a surface battle. At 1915, Admiral Kurita and his cruiser squadron were ordered to bombard and neutralize Midway. The only hope left now for a victory was for a night action between Yamamoto's battleships and heavy cruisers and the American force of carriers and cruisers. Nagumo, who had been viewed as being too passive, was relieved of his command, and Admiral Kondo was left in charge for the upcoming night battle. However, by 2330, no contact had been made, and it was obvious that no surface engagement was forthcoming. If he continued east, he would place his ships in a vulnerable situation the following morning against American air attack. 
So reality finally began to sink in, and shortly after midnight, he cancelled the bombardment of Midway and ordered Kurita to change course to the northwest and join up with the main body. <coughs> yeah, and like I said, the U.S. just has no interest in a surface battle at all, right? The, the whole point of this was to get the Japanese carriers, well, to get the Japanese to commit to Midway so that they could basically be trapped there, right? But that's the whole perk of having carriers to begin with, is that you don't, your surface engagements are not what you do, right? You could go the entire opposite direction and just continuously launch planes off of the carrier to go after the surface vessels. Like, there is absolutely no reason that you would ever even consider going and fighting here. And so with this situation the way that it is, um, yeah, there's just, there's no reason that the U.S. should or, or would even entertain that. And if you're the Japanese here, man, at some point you have just got to cut your losses, right? I mean, you could say it should have been done way earlier than this, but at some point you just, you have to cut your losses and say, okay, well, we lost this one. Like it is what it is, but we can't lose anymore. Like we, we have to go, you know, we have to go before we potentially lose anything else. And if they get in range of Midway, that could be that could be bad news. So I think it's the most prudent move here, although in a situation where really a ton of prudence hadn't been shown. Soon, orders for a general retirement of all his forces were sent, and at 0255, Yamamoto officially canceled the Midway operation. Back to the scene of devastation, the Japanese carriers had been caught in the most vulnerable state possible, with fueled up and armed aircraft on board. As mentioned, each bomb hit was made worse by the secondary explosions that took part inside the hangars. The fires were fed and nourished by the fueled up strike planes, the bombs and torpedoes that hadn't been stored away safely, the fuel in the fuel lines, and other flammable materials found throughout the ship. And the fuel in the fuel lines is... A big deal. That was one of the ways that Yorktown had been able to kind of recover so quickly after it had been hit initially was that they had flooded the, the fuel lines with uh, CO2. And so before, you know, before getting hit, they had flooded the fuel lines and it made it easier to minimize damage, to, to put out fires, right? If you have fuel everywhere, if you have loaded planes and bombs it's just the whole thing is just one big powder keg and efforts to fight the fire successfully were hampered by many reasons one was the poor design of the japanese carriers which made them ill prepared to absorb damage and continue fighting second fire holes and phone spray systems were installed but the water mains were damaged during the attack rendering the systems inoperable and also Japanese fire control abilities were simply subpar. So the fire steadily prevailed, and despite their best efforts, Japanese damage control equipment and training were simply not up to the task. The fires could not be extinguished, and this sealed the fate of the carriers. Soryu and Kaga were burning wrecks. After much deliberation, the decision was made to scuttle them. The Soryu sank at 1913 and lost 711 men. The Kaga sank at 1925, she lost the most personnel of all the carriers, losing 811 officers and men. There was a lot of hesitation with the Akagi, being that she was the flagship of the Kido Butai, but eventually she too was ordered to be scuttled. She sank the following morning, taking 267 souls with her. The Hiryu suffered the same fate, fires had spread and could not be contained and it was soon apparent that she was doomed. Admiral Yamaguchi, sticking true to the naval tradition, decided to go down with the ship. After a sentimental goodbye, 
Yamaguchi and a selected few stayed behind, while the rest of the crew transferred to a nearby destroyer. At 0510 on June 5th, she was also scuttled, struck by a single torpedo. But incredibly, she didn't go down until hours later in the morning. It was just enough time for a Japanese biplane to take this astonishing photo. Apparent is the gaping hole at the front of the ship. A portion of the elevator has been blown against the forward end of the island. Here's another classic shot of her, where we can see that the ship is still on fire amidships. The Hiryu sank some two hours after these photographs were taken at around 0915. 392 men were lost. The decisive phase of the battle was over, yet clashes continued for the next two days, which led to the sinking of the Japanese cruiser Mikuma and the Yorktown. That's right, the stubborn carrier still hadn't sunk at this point. I'll begin with the cruiser action. If we recall, Admiral Kurita, in command of Cruiser Squadron 7, had been tasked with bombarding Midway. Yamamoto ordered this mission to be cancelled 20 minutes past midnight on June 5th. However, the order was delayed by almost two hours before it got to Kurita at 0230. By this time, he was only 50 miles away from Midway. Regardless, he commenced his retreat by changing course to the northwest. But during this, a submarine was spotted. Evasive maneuvers were ordered, and during the confusion, the cruiser Mogami collided with her sister ship, Mikuma. Mogami had her bow smashed and was left behind since she had to limp back home at a slow speed. The Mikuma faithfully stayed alongside her as an escort. The rest of the day, they escaped air attacks by Midway base bombers. But the next day, on June 6, they were bombed repeatedly, but this time from carrier-based aircraft of Task Force 16. Yeah, and that's what I was saying. If you get surface vessels anywhere near these aircraft carriers, that's going to be a problem. Because the, the carriers don't have to stay anywhere close to these vessels to still be in range with their planes. And so it's just a bad matchup. I mean, that's why carriers became so popular is because of, you know, how how kind of versatile they are and how much of a bad matchup they are for a lot of different things. Five hits landed on Mogami, five on Mikuma, and one on a destroyer. Despite her collision damage and the hits, Mogami managed to escape, while ironically, it was the Mikuma that succumbed to her wounds. Wow. American pilots took pictures of the mortally wounded ship. The destruction of the Mikuma is clear. The ship sank at 1930 with a heavy loss of life, with as many as 700 of her crew unaccounted for. Retribution was obtained against the Americans. On June 4th, the Yorktown was abandoned, but despite appearing that she was about to capsize, she was found still afloat on the 5th. With the battle practically won and the Japanese in retreat, the idea of getting back to her and towing her to port seemed like a real possibility. Which would have just been completely, completely incredible. I cannot... If the Yorktown would have made it out of this battle, that would have just been completely absurd. So the next day, on June 6th, the destroyer Hammond brought on board a salvage team. The destroyer remained moored next to the Yorktown to provide power. The team began to have progress. Power was restored, the list was corrected, and soon the Yorktown was being towed at three knots. But lurking in the waters was submarine I-168. She had been dispatched by Yamamoto to finish off the Yorktown. The submarine skillfully approached, unnoticed, and patiently waited for the perfect shot. Although five destroyers were on patrol, no one spotted the submarine. She closed in and at 1500 meters released four torpedoes. The first hit the Hammond, which split the ship in half, and the second and third hit the Yorktown. The carrier was done for, and the salvage team evacuated the ship. The following pictures tell the story. The Hammond is shown sinking here after breaking in half. As she was going under, her depth charges exploded. 
killing more of her survivors nearby in the water. 84 of her crew went down with her. Even with four torpedo wounds, the Yorktown still took a while to sink. And before she did, she rode on her back, revealing the gaping torpedo wounds from the submarine attack. On June 7th, the distinguished ship, the ship that had played such a pivotal role in Coral Sea and Midway, finally slipped beneath the waters at 0500. 57 men were lost. So now we can go to the final losses of the battle. Japan lost four fleet carriers, one cruiser, and 250 aircraft. But they didn't have a heavy loss in pilots. Only 121 airmen were lost that day. Yeah, the big loss is not specifically the pilots. Obviously, the loss of the carriers is a huge deal. But it's the, it's the people on the carriers. It's just... It's a lot of time and experience, and it's just really, really, really hard to replace that. What they truly lost were the four irreplaceable carriers and the experienced and highly skilled aircraft mechanics and technicians on board them. These men were difficult to replace. Yeah, exactly. By best estimates, Japan lost 3,057 men. Damn, I did not realize it was that many men. For the Americans, the cost had been relatively small for what they had accomplished. They had lost one carrier, one destroyer, and 144 planes. Total losses in men, 362. There was no question about it, the Battle of Midway had been a decisive American victory. Okay, so this was the Battle of Midway Part 2, the Hiryu's Counter-Strike. Man, this just, the Battle of Midway just totally changes the complexion of the war in the Pacific. Japan had just had carte blanche up to this point, And it just totally changes that equation. Put down in the comments below your thoughts on this. Uh, decisions that that Japan made tactics that were used on both sides I'm curious what everybody thinks or or you know what they know about it so put that down in the comments below as always like comment subscribe help me keep building the channel over here I'll put the link to the discord down below and I'll see you all next time